Okay, so whereas I have given you background on Jeremy Bentham and on John Stuart Mill, and even more so on Immanuel Kant and on Elizabeth Anscombe, as we've addressed these different philosophers behind these ethical theories, I'm not going to bother to do so with Aristotle as far as the biographical information, because I believe that Wolf does a very good job with him in chapter 12 of your text. So this is the motif we've had for the course right from the get-go, that of aiming and shooting with a bow, and of aiming and shooting at a target. And it was Aristotle who we first saw referring to doing this, to, to ethics as being a process like unto this. I have a number of friends who are clergy from different religions, both Eastern and Western, and I have been told by pretty much every one of them that the concept of ethics as a process of aiming at the bullseye is a concept that exists within their faith as well. I don't know if it has any basis in Aristotle or if it comes primarily from the religious faith themselves and the way that they conceptualize it, but it's fascinating how helpful this concept is for the doing of ethics across time. So when we're dealing with Aristotle, we're dealing with, especially today, the field of virtue ethics. There are some other, other schools of ethics that are lesser schools of ethics as far as the knowledge of them that are also associated with Aristotle. But primarily today, virtue ethics is what's being referred to when we bring up Aristotle. So when we're speaking about Aristotle, we're speaking about ethics of the person rather than the ethics of the act. Okay, we, and we want to say, I want to say, we, we don't just judge acts and situations. We judge individuals. We judge people. So judgments having to do with individuals or with people is what we've got in mind when we're referring to virtue ethics. Whether it's ourselves or it's other people, virtue ethics is addressing whether or not the person in question is acting with character, is acting with virtue. And important to the school is a notion that we're going to address in a later video uh, of a PowerPoint, the notion of habituation in virtue, of training oneself in virtue. So I want you to think of somebody you admire. I'd ask that it not be somebody you just admire because of their athletic prowess, but think more holistically of the whole person. Think of somebody you admire. It, it can be a living person, somebody perhaps even a relative, or someone from human history, maybe a teacher you had, in the past, somebody who was a mentor, someone from religion, even a, a fictional character, but a character that you admire. And now ask yourself what it is that causes you to admire that person. And what I think you'll find is that you have to explain your admiration and your respect in terms of certain character qualities that you see in that person. Many times they're character qualities that make you want to emulate them and be like them. And qualities like those are what we are referring to when we're referring to virtue. Now, Aristotle has a way of being able to identify what the virtues are. You saw that Philip, uh, not Philip of Foot, but that Elizabeth Anscombe said that his was a completely secular, non-religious way to try to identify what we ought and ought not to do. And his way of doing this is to find a midpoint or a mean between two behavioral extremes, a continuum. So... Here's the idea of that continuum, a deficit of a particular character trait or an excess of it or a particular behavior. So think first, like with courage, there's an appropriate, a right amount of fear for people to have with regard to danger. If I have courage, I have the right amount of fear. Courageous people are not fearless. But to have courage is to have the right amount of fear as opposed to an excess of rashness or recklessness where I'd throw my life away because perhaps I think I'm indestructible or something. And the other would be a deficit that I don't have enough of the ability to overcome this fear. I'm overwhelmed by it. And so I lack this characteristic called courage and I'm a coward. Okay. And we'll go forward with this. Generosity is a midpoint between stinginess and wastefulness. Uh, if I if I cling to the stuff that is mine and I'm unwilling to open my hands and share it with anybody, I'm stingy. If I'm so open-handed and willing to give that I'm wasteful, that's also a problem. But if I have generosity, it means I know how to manage my own things well and to take care of my own responsibilities, but I also am willing to share and open up to others so that they can have. And it doesn't have to be necessarily things. It could be time. You could be generous or stingy or wasteful with your time. Then to be modest is to be appropriate in the degree to which you speak about yourself or 
um, that you uh, well there's other ter other ways that modest can be used too as far as dress and that sort of thing but I think it's still kind of the same principle if I'm arrogant with my dress or with my behavior I'm calling unnecessary attention to myself by the way I dress or by the way that I behave if I'm sheepish I'm a shrinking violet I'm hesitant I don't want anybody to see me and I, I don't want anybody to know me but if I'm modest I speak appropriately so somebody asks me about myself and I tell them the truth about myself I'm not filled with braggadocio and I'm not somebody who hides behind trees, you know, when people are around, but I'm modest. To be empathic or empathetic is to be somebody who is willing to try to understand where other people are coming from and how they feel and why they feel the way they do. To have a deficit of this characteristic is to be apathetic, literally no feeling. That's what the word means, to have no feelings together with others. To be sentimental or syrupy or... I don't know what other terms we might want to use, is to have too much empathy. I, I knew a man in New York State um, who had so much empathy that it, it could incapacitate him. He could become depressed because somebody else was feeling badly. That's not helpful. To have compassion, the literal meaning of the word is to feel together with others. To, to not have compassion, have the deficit of this character quality, is to have cruelty. I could hurt you and not care at all that I'm hurting you. I feel nothing for you. Or I could have indulgence, that I'm too much concerned with how you feel. And oftentimes we have that parents spoil their children, or grandparents spoil their grandchildren, because they're indulgent. They don't just have compassion, they indulge them. I, I've been a sports uh, coach in the past and had parents that were indulged their children and did them a disservice by so doing. To be prudent, literally, the word means to have practical wisdom with regard to life, but it, it really means, as far as the way used here, prudent as far as how I would interact with others. To be imprudent is for me to be loud and boisterous and inappropriately so, and to be repressed is for me to be kind of like have that I've, I've got this too much of this restraint that I see in a prudent person, so I'm all buttoned up, kind of like I've got a we call it maybe relational constipation. But to be prudent is I, I know when to restrain myself. I know when to hold back. I think you get the idea of how these things work. And I don't think neat is typically a term that we use for virtue. Uh, but neat is, you know, we have a conception of a person being a neat or a clean cut or somebody who is a person who takes care of themselves as opposed to being sloppy. That's the deficit. And persnickety is not a word you hear a lot today, but the person who's like extremely obsessive compulsive, uh, obsessive, uh, obsessive compulsive about their appearance or about uh, their surroundings, uh, a person who's fastidious, who's just eaten up with a need for everything to be just so. But that's a little bit too much, right? So you can get the, the feel for courage and generosity and modesty and uh, empathy and compassion and prudence and neatness to be things that are virtuous in this sense. Okay, so in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle poses the question, what is good? What is the good life? And this is the very first paragraph of the Nicomachean Ethics. Very first, this is out of the starting gates. Every art and every investigation, and similarly, every action and pursuit is considered to aim at some good. Hence, the good has been rightly defined as that at which all things aim. Now, so, sometimes it's our imagined good, and sometimes it's our real good. We can get this confused, right? We talk about people looking for love in all the wrong places. We think somebody who's doing that isn't actually pursuing their true good, but they still think that it is the good that they're, they're going after. So the good is the bullseye. That's the point. So the good is always what we desire. It's the aim of all activity, whether moral or not, and whether it's really good or it just looks to be good. So the, we can have things that are our apparent goods that aren't really our goods. Then what Aristotle asks, he asks the question, will not the knowledge of it then have a great influence on life? If we could just identify what our true good is, shall we not, like archers who have a mark to aim at, be more likely to hit upon what is right? So if that is the case, we need to try at least an outline to determine what it is. And we got to also figure out which of the sciences or capacities or disciplines it is the object of. So this is the business of doing ethics. It's aiming for the good, trying to find the good. So now he makes a fine point here and he says, clearly, however, there are some differences between the ends at which they aim. Some are activities and others are results distinct from the activities. 
What's he mean by that? He means some things we don't want for themselves alone. You don't really want money so that you can be like Scrooge McDuck diving into your, your money pit, into your money vault. You want money so you can do things with money. So it's the things that you want to do with the money that could be different from the desire for money. Where there are ends distinct from the actions, the results are by nature superior to the activities. You get what he's saying? He's saying some things we don't want for themselves, we want them as a means to another end. If then there's some end of the things we do which we desire for its own sake, there's only very few things that fit into this category, love, relationship, happiness, contentment, if then there is some end of the things we do which we desire for its own sake and for the sake of which we want all other ends, and if we do not choose everything for the sake of something else, because that's a logical impossibility, it would deal with infinite progression so that your aim is pointless and ineffectual. If there's something like this, clearly this must be the good, that is, the supreme good. What Aristotle's going to eventually tell us is that the supreme good is a state of being called eudaimonia. We'll, we'll have a PowerPoint that addresses that. But He's saying that there's something that's an, an end in itself, or things which are ends in themselves. So with this terminology, he's addressing the difference between means to an end and ends in themselves. This is a story of King Midas and his golden touch. I find my students are not that familiar with this story these days. So King Midas is a story from the ancient world about a king who takes under wing a satyr, a half horse, half person, individual. He's a satyr who winds up drunk and is found by some of the king, by King Midas's, uh, his servants, and they bring him to King Midas, and King Midas takes good care of him. And he ultimately discovers that he is the stepfather of Dionysius, who is a god in his, in his age, and he brings him to his, uh, he, he brings the satyr to Dionysius. And Dionysius rewards him with, he, he tells him he could wish for something, and he would grant the wish. And so he wants the ability to be able to have whatever he touches turn into gold. So Aristotle, when he tells the story of, of what this legend is about, it, it's about ultimately that uh, King Midas dies because everything he turns he touches turns into gold, so he can't eat anything. He starves to death, and he curses the gift that he asked for. Nathaniel Hawthorne gets a hold of the story, and this book cover that you see here is actual, actually the Nathaniel Hawthorne version of the story, and this particular one has a, a happy ending, and it's that King Midas has a daughter whom he loves above everyone else. And when she comes to him, he touches her and she turns to gold. And he appeals to the god, and the god undoes the gold touch. And so the daughter is restored, and King Midas now knows that what he wants more than he wants gold or anything else is he wants the people he loves. He's learned the lesson of the difference between means and ends. He, he knows that, that wealth is, a, is a, a means towards the end of family and love. You get it? So, we tend to confuse means with ends. For instance, we tend to forget that sex is for something bigger than sex alone. Later on in the course, I typically, I'm not going to have you live in this course, this is an asynchronous course, but I'll ask my students in the classroom, what is sex for? The very first thing they always say, pleasure. The next thing, I'll say, what is sex for? And they say, well, reproduction. And I, then I say, now let's think a little bit more deeply. What else is sex for? And then ultimately we get to relationships. But actually, the sexual is about human relationships. So, I want to say that sex is ultimately, it's about pleasure, and for sure it's about reproduction, but it's especially about human relationship and having intimate relationships with other human beings. So, just like some people confuse means and ends with sex, so also they do it with their work. And you can see this kind of this graphic where this lady's trying to, on the left side of the page, you see the things that she's trying to do as a mom and as a, a mother, and on the right side, you see concerns from her work life and trying to balance the two things. It's, it's an, an issue as far as to, to find where balance is. We human beings tend to get things out of balance. And one of the most helpful things that could happen to us is that we'd be able to distinguish the difference between means and ends. Discerning the difference between things which are means to an end and the things which are ends in themselves is a valuable skill. It can make a significant difference in your life and in your sense of success and contentment as a person. This is one of the big lessons that Aristotle teaches us.